Before I pray today, a quick word to parents. In the couple first minutes of my sermon, I'll be talking about something that may lead to questions from younger children. They may be good questions for you to address, or they may not. That's obviously up to you. Um, but just know that, and uh, if it's time to send your child to go get a drink or something, you can do that now. Um, but again, it's just be the first couple minutes of the sermon. Let's pray together. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So it was an odd thing I noticed in the main hallway of Church of the Incarnation. There was an empty space among the portraits of the 20-something priests who had served there over its long history. And you could see that a picture was missing because the paint was a bit brighter, a bit less faded where it had hung. So I asked Father Steve, the rector, about it. And this is what he told me. Oh, that's so-and-so. And I've actually forgotten his name. He was a sexual predator. Someone must have got tired of looking at his picture again and hidden it. Congregation members here do that sometimes. What? I mean, I was speechless. What do you say to that? Steve went on to tell me how Father so-and-so's time at incarnation had done deep and long-lasting damage to the church. In fact, when Steve began his ministry there 20 years previously, there was so little trust for clergy at incarnation that the wardens refused to give him, their priest, a key to the church building. Now, I'd like to tell you that this sort of insight into sin in the church's past just happened to me once. But a few years later, when I became a deacon, I was assigned to another congregation in the area. Let's call it Hope Church. And guess what I found out? When Father So-and-So's misdeeds had caught up with him at incarnation, well, he'd received some counseling from the diocese. But then he was reassigned to Hope Church. And once again, he abused his position, doing untold damage to a second congregation before he was finally defrocked and permanently removed from ministry. Now first, I want to be clear, Father so-and-so abused the trust placed in him, well, a long time ago now, probably close to 50 years ago. And since then, a lot has changed in the American church and in our culture as a whole. Things that used to be hidden are brought into the light. And that's a good thing. I'm confident that here and now a father so-and-so, let's say in our diocese here in the Mid-Atlantic, would be removed from ministry quickly and without some sort of second chance. And he would also not be able to simply move to another church within the Anglican Church in North America. We have systems that have been built precisely to stop that sort of thing. Now, not to get too sidetracked by exciting things like church structure, but that's actually one of the advantages of a body organized like Anglicanism is, with dioceses and bishops bound together in national and international groups. It's harder for bad actors like Father so-and-sos to, to just move down the road and start over like nothing's happened. But why? Why does there seem to have been so many bad actors, so many father so-and-sos in the church. Shouldn't the church be the place where, where these sorts of people are least likely to plant themselves? Well, let's hear from our gospel reading this morning, from Matthew 13, starting at verse 24. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. Weeds among the wheat. Or to put it the way an old rhyme does, where God erects a house of prayer, the devil builds a chapel there. Have you heard that before? 
Well, it's the sad truth sometimes, isn't it? There are weeds in the wheat in our churches. There can even be a devil's chapel. There is hardly a problem or sin that is outside of the church in the world that can't be found inside of us at church as well. So how do we respond to this reality, this reality of weeds in the wheat? Well, this morning I want to talk about two aspects that Jesus points us to in our response here in Matthew 13. And the first, I think, is just how we should feel about the reality of weeds and the wheat. And secondly, what we should do about weeds and the wheat. So how do we feel about it? How do we feel about weeds and the wheat? Should we be disappointed? Angry? Should it make us give up on our faith? People have responded in all these ways over the years, and it's hard, not, it's hard to not understand why, isn't it? I feel like I mangled that phrase. Let's try it again. And it's not hard to understand why, is it? There we go. It hurts. It hurts when someone, particularly a leader in the church, not only sins or stumbles, but brings others down with them. I expect some of us personally know about this sort of pain. For my own part this week, I've been struggling with a, with a past church betrayal I just learned about that hurt a friend of mine. And even though this happened years ago, it's hard to put into words just how disappointed and angry it makes me to learn that a leader I trusted broke that trust. One of the advantages of preaching is that I can preach to myself. And I admit I'm doing a bit of that this morning. So disappointment, anger, resignation, rejection, a sense of betrayal. How do we respond? How do we feel about weeds and the wheat? Well, I don't think that Jesus actually points us to any of of these common responses this morning. I think, I think he actually points us to a kind of hope. Now that's not to say anger is inappropriate. It's okay, right even, to be angry when the church in particular does not act with justice or deal with its own failings honestly. But even so, even so, we can face the weeds in the wheat with hope because they are not a surprise. And they are not a sign that God's church is somehow doomed. They aren't a surprise because we see here in Matthew 13 that Jesus himself predicted the situation we find ourselves in long before today. That's what he's doing here. And remember, Jesus not only predicted the weeds in the wheat. He didn't say, well, you may experience this. He also experienced them in his own ministry. Friends, if Jesus had a Judas among his disciples, it should be no surprise to us that our churches attract a few of Judas's spiritual children from time to time. And notice, notice as much as Judas was set against Jesus and God's kingdom, in the end, even the evil he carried out did not derail God's work. Far from it, God used this most painful betrayal in human history, and even the price, 30 pieces of silver, as the linchpin in Holy Week and for the fulfillment of Scripture. So we can have hope when we see weeds in the wheat, because Jesus predicted and experienced them himself. And we can also hope because God again and again turns evil for good, even great evil. But this is not the only reason we hope. We also hope because of what Jesus says as he explains his image of weeds and the wheat, starting in verse 36 here in Matthew 13. And look at verse 41 in particular. He says, The Son of Man will send his angels 
and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. Ultimately, Jesus is saying there will be a separation of weeds from wheat. We will see justice done. Every betrayal will be answered for. Every abuse will be punished. Things will be made right. We can hope in that fact, and we should hope, not because we're vindictive, but because we know that justice has a champion. The devil's chapel that we sometimes see gathered and built in the midst of the church, it will be torn down and burned. So when we see weeds in the wheat, well, we may be tempted to just be disappointed or angry. And we do have good reasons to feel that way. But we can also choose to respond with hope. We can be confident that no matter how bad it looks, the weeds won't doom the church, and the wheat will still grow. And we can look forward to the fact that, though it may feel some days like the weeds will be with us forever, Jesus promises justice. He promises a final separation of weeds from wheat. So we can feel hope and amongst our anger and disappointment. But in the meantime, what should we do? Anything? Well, this is the rub, isn't it? On one hand, Jesus in this parable, well, he does not seem very interested in us purifying the church for him right now, does he? Remember what Jesus has the master say in verse 29 of Matthew 13, when the eager servants offer to to go out and uproot all those weeds in the field. But Jesus said, no, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them, let both grow together until the harvest. What? Does this mean that the church did right, the diocese did right all those years ago by by not removing Father so-and-so after his misdeeds at incarnation were exposed? Are we just supposed to sweep these things under the carpet and go on? Is that what Jesus is saying? No, not at all. The standards for Christian leaders, well, they're high in Scripture. First Timothy says leaders must be above reproach and faithful in marriage and sober-minded and self-controlled and respectable and hospitable and able to teach and not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, among other things. Churches do no less than their jobs when they make sure that the people they trust to lead them live up to high standards. Epiphany here is doing its job when it makes sure that I and Mother Pamela and Deacon Dave and Deacon Sally keep the vows that we made. When the church is doing nothing less than its job, when they, as we do here at Epiphany, make sure those we trust, particularly with our children, are trustworthy. Remember what Jesus himself says in Matthew 18, verse 6, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Lord, may this not be us. And it's right to work so it is not. But here's the nuance. It's one thing to hold leaders to high standards to protect the church and its members. It's another thing entirely to attempt to police the whole field, to cast out and cancel from the church any and everyone who seems to be just a little bit weedy to us. Friends, Jesus' point in this parable is that the church is supposed to be a mixed company, sinners and saints, seekers and finders. 
And many times, we are both of these things at once. To insist, to insist on a purified wheat-only church. Well, that's to insist on a church that, that is too good for any of us to be a member of, at least at certain points in our lives. And it is also to insist on a church that is closed, that has lost contact with the world and the people among which we live. And finally, finally, it would mean being a church, a church where weeds, well, they never have the chance to become wheat. Because this is the call of Jesus to all of us, right? It is to repent. It is to be transformed into the image of Christ. And this is not something that, that is supposed to happen outside of the church magically, and then you get your certificate, and you present it, and then we let you in. This is something that should happen within the church. Martin Luther, in his preaching on this parable, put it this way. He said, the church cannot be without evil people. Those fanatics who don't want to tolerate any weeds end up with no wheat either. And finally, finally, to make ourselves the policers of the whole field is to put ourselves here and now square on God's own judgment seat, separating the wheat from the weeds. And friends, that's above our pay grade. None of us should want to sit in that seat. We don't belong there. So what do we do? What do we do when we look out on the wheat and weed field, filled field in the church? Well, first, even though we, we have good and godly reasons to be angry and disappointed, we recognize that it doesn't mean the church is doomed. Far from it. Jesus himself tells us to expect weeds in the wheat here in Matthew 13. And we know, because Jesus tells us here, that no matter how bad things look now, justice will be done in the end. Friends, that devil's chapel, well, it's poorly built and flammable. Secondly, we take our responsibility to, to hold our leaders, to hold our ministers to high standards. We take that very seriously to protect the body of the church. And finally, finally, we keep the door open and the light on for both weeds and wheat, or to put it more hopefully, for weeds who through Christ's great transforming power may become wheat one day. Amen.